recording. Start sharing my screen. Okay. So post midterm data mining. Got uh, two announcements to start class with today. These are mostly announcements for the CMC students here. The first one on the right, the big yellow one. Uh, so this Friday, the uh, yeah, so it's computer science at CMC combined with the math department, not its own separate department. And we're having a math tea this Friday. Um, all the uh, professors getting together at uh, 2.30 in the, the ath courtyard. And the, uh, you can feel free to talk to us about whatever you would like uh, or to talk to yourselves and ignore us. Um, but the main purpose of it is that uh, if you're thinking about like what classes to take next semester and you want to talk to uh, find out more about the details of of those classes, um, then that will be something we're doing. For the data science majors at CMC, there's going to be a class offered next semester by Professor Cannon, uh, graph algorithms, and I strongly encourage all the data science majors to take this class. If I had my way, it would be a required class uh, for the data science major. Um, high level idea of this class, we'll see. So if you're not at CMC, you can't take it because you've already taken it or will take it through your uh, other um, uh, CS programs. Um, but it's, it's called graph algorithms, but it's just like a regular algorithms class. It's traditionally sort of thought of as the, uh, the theory class of a CS major. Uh, and most of the sort of uh, interview questions for like a, a computer science software engineering role that's not data mining oriented, not machine learning oriented would come from the, the graph algorithms class. So exploring lots of uh, the traditional algorithms, how do you write your own algorithms for certain problems and going into a lot more detail on things like the NP completeness, how to prove that certain problems are NP complete or um, hard for various other reasons. Um, any questions about any of those announcements? I will be teaching next semester a big data course uh, that's sort of like the opposite end of uh, this course. Um, this course, very theory oriented, lots of math. The big data course, Basically, no math, lots of programming, uh, working with uh, Docker containers, uh, SQL, setting up uh, systems to uh, do data processing on a like a swarm of computers. Um, uh, but I'll talk about yeah, you know, I'll, I'll plug that a little bit more later when it's more registration time. So where we are today. We've been working through this model zoo packet. We should finish it today, hopefully. And again, the idea of this uh, section of, of the class is that if you look through scikit-learn or any of these other uh, programming libraries, they have many, many different uh, models implemented. And what we're talking about is how to choose which one of these models you want to, uh, to use for a particular problem. And there's, uh, like in the big picture of data mining classes that are offered around the world, there's classes that are more like this class, focusing on the uh, theory, uh, talking about VC dimension, using that to choose which algorithm to use. More, most of the more recently like developed classes follow this line of thinking, uh, because libraries like scikit-learn are actually a fairly new thing. Um, these days, nobody writes any of these algorithms from scratch. That you just use scikit-learn and or the equivalent in R or whatever language you're using. Um, but actually, if you go back uh, even ten years ago, uh, scikit-learn didn't exist. There were no like standard machine learning algorithm packages, and uh, so ten years ago. Uh, you had to write all of these things from scratch, do it all yourself. And 
Um, so the more the older style classes for data mining, have you actually implementing these things, sort of not thinking about the theory, not thinking about things like VC dimension, not thinking about things like when you should actually use them, uh, just uh, doing the implementation. But we're more focused on when to actually use each algorithm because nowadays nobody actually implements them from scratch. We talked about, uh, started talking about the linear models again. So uh, linear SVM is basically the same thing as logistic regression. And then the naive Bayes and this quadratic discriminant analysis over here, uh, they're strictly worse than uh, the linear models with a polynomial kernel. The key idea of all of these models, again, is that you have a hypothesis class and a learning algorithm. And so these have the same hypothesis class over here, just a strictly inferior learning algorithm. And so you'd always pick the the SVM or logistic regression over naive Bayes or quadratic discriminant analysis. Then we talked about neural networks and the idea of the neural network high level idea was that instead of us picking the, uh, the feature map, uh, us having to think about that in advance, we'll just use the data to learn the feature map for us automatically. And then we talked about decision trees and uh, we had our uh, VC dimension bounds for uh, decision trees. Just looking at the pictures here, one of the things that you can see is that the decision trees have very like square looking uh, shapes in their decision boundary here. And that's because it's looking at only an individual access at a time. If, if your data has any correlation between the different features, then something like a, a, a logistic regression is probably gonna be better. And, but if your data has no correlation between the features, so you'd never wanna look at multiple features at once, then something like a decision tree is likely to be good. We're gonna start talking about uh, ensemble methods here is our next thing to talk about. So, Actually, maybe before we do the ensemble methods, we'll do one or two of these problems from uh, decision trees. So problem number five here, that uh, again, like all these problems are focused on how do you decide which algorithm to use in a particular situation? Where are my little... Hmm, doesn't want to bring up my... little stylus thing. Um, but let's close that real quick. Open up a new one. Let's see if this fixes things. Okay, problem number five here. So the question is asking between, it's giving us two different uh, models to pick from, and it's asking which one of those models we might want to use in this particular situation. And for any particular learning uh, task, the two most important things to know about are always how many data points you have and how many features do you have? Because those two things together, um, well, with the number of features, we can calculate our VC dimension for any of our uh, hypothesis classes that we're choosing. And then we can determine whether we'll have good or bad generalization error, combining that with the number of uh, data points. So here for the L2 normalized logistic regression, so I'll write L2 LR for uh, that thing right there. What is the VC dimension here for this model? That's right, D plus one. So anytime you have a logistic regression, no feature map, the, it's using the linear hypothesis class. Um, logistic regression, no feature map. So it's the linear hypothesis class. And, um, and we talked about the L2 normalized logistic regression. Let me write out what that actually does here. So our the H is equal to X into the sine of W transpose X, where X is in R to the D. 
And then the L2 norm squared of W is less than or equal to some hyperparameter C. So this is controlling the, uh, somehow restricting the magnitude of, of our hypothesis class. It's making it smaller, but it makes it smaller in a way that doesn't actually affect the VC dimension. Um, so this, in practice, this tends to like, uh, uh, improve generalization a little bit, but since the VC dimension is staying the same, it, it you can't get huge dramatic improvements in VC dimension from L2 normalization or L2 regularization. Um, and so the VC dimension stays the same as D plus one, because that's just the VC dimension for any uh, linear hypothesis class. And so that's the first one. For any of these problems where it's asking you to compare which one do you think you should use, then you'll want to make sure that you write down the VC dimension for both of them. Uh, so then decision trees, DT, the VC dimension. Uh, so let's just scroll up right here. We have uh, the multiple formulas right here, but this is the one that I think is more general. So the easier one to remember, the VC dimension is O of K log KD. So O of K log KD here. And now the K right here is the, uh, the number of nodes, internal nodes, nodes in the decision tree. And uh, for our purposes right now, the important thing is we're looking at the dependence on D. So sometimes people might just write this as O of log D, since we're only at this point concerned with the D, not thinking about the number of uh, internal nodes in here. So thinking about that as a constant. And the uh, dependence on D for the decision tree, much, much better than the dependence on D for logistic regression over here. And in particular, with only uh, with only a thousand data points, uh, the VC dimension of being a million, we're gonna not be able to uh, generalize well with this one up here. Uh, but here, uh, the log of the number of dimensions up here that'll be like six instead of a million, and so this will have a much smaller VC dimension. Decision tree has much smaller VC dimension. And you might have to do some tuning still of the number of nodes that you uh, want in your decision tree. Maybe, I don't know, depth one or two or three all seem like reasonable things to try here. Uh, but once you get beyond that, again, the, the K here is growing exponentially with the depth of your tree. Uh, that if J is the depth or the height, then the K equals to J, two to the J. And so if you're beyond like three, then your uh, VC dimension, I would guess is starting to get too big for, for a problem like this with only a thousand data points. Um, but the, with the problems asking which one of these models to use, decision tree, definitely much smaller VC dimension. Question. Yeah, so the question is, why did I choose something with a smaller VC dimension here? How did I know to do that? And the answer is that because in this problem, it's specifically saying that it specifically gives us the number of data points here, n equals 10 to the third, then I know um, a rule of thumb from the textbook is that VC dimension should be approximately the number of data points divided by 10. That you, in practice, to get like as a good starting point, good rule of thumb, take your uh, whatever your VC dimension is, multiply that by 10, and that's the number of data points that you need. And so here, uh, about uh, n equals 10 to the third, so a, th a thousand data points, a VC dimension of about 100 is something that is a a reasonable starting point. Our uh, L2 normalized logistic regression VC dimension of a million, so way off the mark. The decision tree uh, VC dimension log of D, so that's like six ish here, uh, depending on what base you use. Um, 
And then in order to, we can bump that up just a little bit, approaching to the uh, uh, VC dimension of 100 by changing this K value, making the depth of the decision tree a little bit, a bit, a little bit larger, a little bit more complicated. If the problem had instead said, instead of 10 to the third, said 10 to the ninth, then, uh, then the decision tree is more likely to underfit the problem. And then I would start thinking logistic regression, uh, maybe even with a, a polynomial kernel would be a, a good fit for this problem. That answer your question? Cool. Any, good question. Any other questions about this? Okay, uh, it, what if for whatever reason, I really did want to use logistic regression for this problem, then how should I change? What should I do differently in order to use logistic regression? What are some of the tools that we have to reduce the VC dimension? Uh, you would apply like teacher math like randomly. Okay, if in order to use, um, the yeah, logistic regression, I could use a uh, one of the dimensionality reduction techniques that we have. So we saw there's the PCA or the random projections, uh, two possible techniques. Um, what's a third thing that I could do for logistic regression? Uh, good question. So uh, there's the decision stump um, feature map and uh, Actually, it turns out that if you apply the decision stump feature map and then use logistic regression, that's 100% mathematically equivalent to using a decision tree with depth uh, one. Um, um, so that is something we could do. It, and it turns out to just making it be a very simple decision tree. Uh, what's something else that we could do? OK, we could increase the number of data points, um, but that probably costs money. Uh, with something without increasing the number of data points. So there's another type of uh, normalization, uh, regularization that we could use besides L2 regularization. What was that called? L1 regularization. L1 regularization actually reduces our uh, VC dimension. Uh, it induces sparsity. Apologize, I'm writing in the margins here. Induces sparsity, which implied that it reduces the VC dimension. And the VC dimension in particular was gonna be equal to uh, o times the number of non-zeros in n z of uh, the w vector. Um, and then there's some log term that nobody cares about. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so this is uh, L1 uh, regularized logistic regression, a very common thing to use when your number of data points is smaller than the number of dimensions you have. Uh, again, if this were like a real world practical problem, uh, what I would probably do is I would try the L1 normalized logistic regression. That's actually probably the thing that I would try first. And uh, also try the decision trees and whichever one of those uh, adjust them so they both have the same VC dimension. And then whichever one of those has the best in sample error, uh, pick that as my final hypothesis. Uh, this is in in z of w and then that's just empty uh, parentheses over there because there's stuff in there that uh, I think it's inside the parentheses it's supposed to be in in z of w times d I think it might be divided by d but with big o notation it'll it'll be this is definitely true it might just not be the tightest thing but nobody even cares about things in log terms if there's something the same out here. Uh, 
Um, yeah, so again, this is the kind of reasoning that I'm uh, expecting you all to be able to do for the, uh, the next upcoming midterm and the uh, upcoming uh, final exam. It'll be an oral exam again. Uh, and the, you know, we'll talk about the details, the format of that, how that'll work later. But most of those, most of the problems, the things that I'll be asking you in the oral exam will be something like this. And then having you reason through, basically talking about everything that we've talked about in the class so far about related to a problem, something like this. Um, let's see, the next problem. So problem number six, if you were to double the height of a decision tree from three to six, approximately how much more data do you need to achieve the same generalization error? So this is a, really a problem asking you, how does the VC dimension change? as the height or the depth gi height so that doesn't look great we'll go with it if change it as the oh yeah what's that h doing as the height uh changes from three to six um well the vc dimension again vc dimension are bound uh, is O of K log K D. And uh, we'll ignore the, the log term here for simplicity. And uh, well, actually, we don't even need to, to ignore it that we had the simplifying formula <coughs> equals O of two to the J times J log D, where D was the where j was the height, and you just plug in these numbers. So two to the third times three versus two to the six times six. Uh, two to the third, eight times three. Two to the six is 64 times three times two. So this is 128 times three. And so we need a factor of 128 divided by eight is uh, 32, no, 16. Um, so we need 16 times the amount of data. <clears throat> so this over here is the VC dimension for J equals three. This over here is the VC for J equals six. Just calculated both of them, took the ratio. We know that the amount of data that you need is proportional to the VC dimension. And so we need 16 times the amount of data to make the height of our tree grow from three to six. Um, yeah, so the key, the, the key thing to definitely understand about decision trees is and something that I think everybody intuitively understands is that deeper trees are more complicated, so you need more data. But just the the rate at which they get more complicated is huge; it's exponential. Like three to six doesn't seem like a big change, um, but you need two you need uh, exponentially more data when you uh, make the decision tree deeper. Yeah. Could you explain how any one of these um, so K for uh, uh, K is equal to two to the J when the height is equal to J. And so plugging that in here, um, two to the J for K log two to the J is just J. So two to the J times J log D. So yeah, log two to the J equals J. All right. Um, all right, so yeah, the, I guess that's plus like that would be a slightly tighter bound. 
Yeah, yeah. This this J right here, nobody really cares about it because the two to the J is like the the thing that we care about. Uh, the log D D is not outside of the log, so it's still a little bit important right here. Um, but yeah, that no, that's a good catch. I shouldn't have been that sloppy uh, right here. Uh, but the reason that I was sloppy is because nobody cares about whether that's added or multiplied. It's basically the same growth rate because two to the J here is the dominant thing. Um, good questions and observations. Any other questions about decision trees? Maybe I'll just quick sort of meta comment that, um, so you recall at the beginning of class or beginning of the semester, we talked about this problem here of, um, like OCR image recognition. And we used these uh, different models, trying them out a little bit. Uh, I've been sort of torn throughout the semester about whether I would have you actually do an experiment of or uh, a programming assignment of fiddling around with all of these things to try to uh, get the best possible accuracy that you can. I think that's a good practice to go through, but it's also like, a really annoying thing just sitting in front of the computer waiting for it to uh, train a bunch of models and uh, so I'm not going to make you make you do that um, but if you're looking for a good way to practice these things that would be a good thing to do okay the next hypothesis class that we're going to look at is I think one of the uh, more interesting ones this is actually one of the things that got me uh, 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 it has some very exciting intersections between math and computer science. We're not going to talk about it; those intersections in super detail. Um, uh, but this is an example of a particularly interesting sort of hypothesis class that you can do. And this is called ensemble methods. Um, so here, notice that uh, so this is the name of our hypothesis class. That it's a we're using the L instead of the H now. I don't know why we're using an L, but that's what everybody uses. And then uh, it, this is now taking parameters. It's a hypothesis class with parameters. And there's two parameters that get uh, passed in. This T right here um, is uh, a real number. So yeah, T is a real number. It's sometimes called the number of iterations. Uh, if you're looking at the scikit-learn documentation, it'll uh, use some uh, variation on this terminology for this T value right here for all the different ensemble methods. And then the B right here is uh, what we call a base hypothesis class. And what this is uh, allowing us to do is it's allowing us to take something like uh, decision trees or the perceptron or neural networks and make something that's even more complicated out of them. Um, we're, I'll take a look here at the, the formula here in a second, but before we do that, I want to draw some pictures that'll help give us maybe more geometric intuition before we look at the sort of algebra about what's going on. So that's what we'll do in this blank space down here. And so we'll start with B is the uh, perceptrons. And do, do, do. we have our classic data set that we love of pluses in the middle. That's circle ish minuses along the outside. Then we said in various ways that the perceptron hypothesis class is not good at a uh, data set like this, that it's gonna have a high approximation error because uh, the perceptrons are just hyperplanes and there is no hyperplane that can separate the pluses and the negatives. We talked about somehow modifying the data set in order to uh, make that work with the polynomial kernel and the polynomial kernel worked particularly well on this classic example. Uh, the uh, ensemble methods are sort of like 
a dual or an opposite way of doing that. Instead of modifying the data, instead of transforming the data, we will uh, combine multiple hypotheses together. So the very first hypothesis that we might select would be something uh, like this and uh, an individual hypothesis with positives over here, negatives over here. And uh, yeah, again, that's gonna have a very high uh, training error like this. And then um, what the ensemble method lets us do is it lets us have multiple perceptrons working together at once. So maybe we'll have this one and then we'll add another one right here with positives and negatives. And then another one like this with positives and negatives. And a fourth one, something like this with positives and negatives. And so this, in this particular case, that's the perceptrons with uh, T equals four, because there's four perceptrons that we're combining together. And then at every, any particular point inside of here, what the decision boundary is going to look like is that you add up all the effects of all these four different uh, base hypotheses. This B stands for base. Um, so uh, these four different lines we have here, calling them base hypotheses. And everything in the middle over here is going to be uh, uh, pluses. Every, all the pluses are working together right here. So this is where I'm going to shade this whole thing in green. That's where the positive decision boundary is, the positive labels for our um, for our uh, uh, ensemble method with these four different um, perceptrons all working together. Um, yeah, so the, the ensemble methods are particularly good if um, you've realized that like just one of your base model, like one perceptron by itself has a high training error, but for whatever reason, you don't want to modify your data set with a feature map, uh, but you still want to make your model more complicated, just adding more things working together, then um, the, the ensemble methods can do that. I'm going to go back up here in a second in order to look at the algebra of what's going on here, uh, but are there any questions about the like intuition of this picture? The question is, is it kind of similar to what neural networks do? And the answer is that it turns out that the hypothesis class for ensemble methods is mathematically equivalent to the hypothesis class of neural networks under uh, if you select your B and your T correctly. Uh, so yes, it is, it is very similar. There are lots of close analogies that you can draw. Uh, you'll see that uh, the VC dimension bounds here, it's very similar to the VC dimension bounds for neural networks. Um, um, the difference, at least the way people think about the difference is that if usually if people are using neural networks, they have started with a neural network and um, have selected whatever their depth and uh, width layers are in advance, usually when people are using these ensemble methods, they've started with some sort of base hypothesis like the perceptron, and they just want to make it just a little bit more complicated. And so they pick out the, um, the ensemble method and start adding multiple perceptrons together. Um, but yeah, the mathematics, the theory behind both of these two things, how you would prove things about like the VC dimension, very, very similar to each other. Good question. Any other questions about the geometric intuition behind the ensemble methods? So I'll, algebraically, what's going on here in this hypothesis class? <coughs> so again, the B is our base hypothesis class, the thing that we are selecting from. Each one of these H sub T's is an individual hypothesis. So each one of these lines down here corresponds to a different hypothesis, like this might be H1 and H2 and H3 and H4. And then we'll apply all four of those hypotheses to our incoming data point, weight them all together 
Um, the W's are learned from the data here. These W's. And actually both the, the W's and the HT's are learned from the data. Um, and then, yeah, just doing the, the sign activation here. Two important facts to know about ensemble methods. If, uh, yeah, so it's less important to be able to look at the hypothesis class and uh, intuit what's going on. But the things that you absolutely have to, have to know are this, again, the universal approximation theorem. All of these universal approximation theorems are telling us which data point or which hyperparameter do we have to increase in order to make our training error go to zero. And in this case, it's always the, the T. As T goes into infinity, our training error will go to zero. And there's a typo here in these notes. This definition one shouldn't be here. And uh, this is all supposed to uh, go together. Technically, in order for, make, for this to work out, um, B has to be something called a weak learner. Uh, but everything that's implemented in scikit-learn and anything that anybody cares remotely about is a weak learner. Um, if, you're, if your hypothesis, if your model is somehow learning from the data in any way, then it's a weak learner. So this will work for anything. Uh, the statement is true for any possible um, uh, uh, situation inside of scikit-learn. Yeah, and the important thing here is that you make t go to infinity, and you will uh, hit zero training here. Coming down here to this uh, intuitive picture, um, right now we would still, uh, well, this particular example has zero training error, uh, but we could easily imagine there being more like negative points kind of around the edges over here in these corners that aren't fully captured by this model. And then we would have to add more, uh, more decision boundaries down here like this to uh, fully capture that. And the more of these that we add, the better of an approximation that we can get to the, the circle that actually encloses this. Any questions about that universal approximation property? Okay, then the, yeah, so T going to infinity makes our uh, training error go down to zero. We also need to talk about the generalization error. We do that with the VC dimension. So here is our uh, bound on the VC dimension that uh, uh, as, yeah, so you have uh, the important things here are the T and the DVC of B. Um, and then it's a log factor of T times DVC of B again. Down here, we have four models. Again, T equals four, B equals uh, the perceptrons. So the um, VC dimension of that, again, theta of D. And you plug in these values up here to get a bound on your actual VC dimension for, for this particular model. Okay, so we'll go on to some problems where we actually do that next. So this first one, problem eight here says that decision trees are some of the most commonly boosted models. Um, these uh, ensemble methods uh, also referred to as boosting. And actually, if we come over to scikit-learn for a second, uh, so there you can see there's a big set of uh, ensemble methods actually implemented inside of scikit-learn. This Ada Boost one is the, uh, the most famous of them. Uh, probably 80% of the time that people are uh, using ensemble methods, they're using uh, Ada Boost. Uh, and then oops, outside of uh, scikit-learn, some popular Popular boosting, again, synonym for ensemble um, packages are 
XG boost and light GBM. GBM stands for gradient boosted machine. Um, if you do things on Kaggle regularly, uh, XG boost is almost always the algorithm that ends up being the final winner for, for Kaggle. And it's um, just a matter of figuring out what are the right hyperparameters to set for XG boost. Uh, again, the most important being how many base models you have and what exact which exact base model you're using. Um, and then doing feature engineering as well to control your uh, VC dimension. Yeah, actually, it's, uh, in terms of like uh, state of the art things as well, uh, deep learning is very famous right now for uh, being the state of the art solution for like vision and text situations. But if you're not doing vision and you're not doing text, then boosting is state of the art for everything else. Um, so if somebody just gave me like a random CSV file and said, do some predictions on it uh, and get the best possible accuracy, don't care about runtime, don't care about anything else, uh, XG boost or ADA boost or light GPM uh, would be my um, like go-to thing to use. Um, in order to use any of these algorithms, again, we have to talk about the VC dimension. We have this general formula for the VC dimension up above, but uh, we have to make that concrete for whichever particular base model we're actually boosting. Uh, decision trees are the most popular thing, most commonly uh, boosted algorithm. Uh, and uh, logistic regression is the second most popular. Uh, I don't know if in practice people actually boosting anything besides those two. Uh, so, so here, provide a tight upper bound on the VC dimension for an ensemble of decision trees. So again, our VC dimension was equal to O of T DVC of B times the log of T uh, DVC of B, that kind of obnoxious thing. And uh, so what we need to know is what is the DVC of B, DVC of B, uh, it's talking about decision trees right here. So that's equal to O of K log KD. And we substitute this into this, uh, uh, a formula right here, and we get that back to green. O of T times K log K D times log of T uh, log. K, D, like that, if I did all my substitutions correctly. Um, again, the main uh, factors here that people are going to care about uh, that'll make reasoning about this simple is uh, you wanna find what is the factor in here that's the largest, most important for each one of the variables that we have to consider. There's three variables to consider, T, K, and D. T and K both have the linear dependence. D has the, uh, the log dependence right here. And everything inside of here is just a repeat. Um, so in practice, people won't consider any of those things and just like think about it as T, K times log D. And so now that, now that we have this, uh, this bound, we can think about how much data we're gonna need for a particular problem and uh, in order to achieve a good generalization error. Um, it, that's what problem two is asking about. Before I do that, are there any questions on where these formulas came from? Is that a question, Chuck? Or? Yeah. Um, yeah, so we got from the lemma and then from the yeah, so this um, uh, only one VC dimension thing for for um, ensembles is listed uh, right do right here. 
And so that's where that green stuff came from. And the blue stuff right here came from, if you scroll up three or four pages to the decision trees, that's what the decision tree VC dimension bound is. And uh, so similarly, you should be able to do something like this. If I ask with uh, logistic regression, uh, L1 or L2 normalized as your base model, and you just plug in the thing to get the, um, to get to get the VC dimension. So if we increase the number of decision trees in the ensemble, then how should we adjust the number of nodes K in, uh, in the decision trees? Then K should decrease. And in particular, it should decrease at the same rate that T is increasing. So again, without having this like full theoretical framework of VC dimension, answering a question like this might be hard to do. Like how do these T and these K parameters uh, interact with each other? Uh, but with our VC dimension framework, it becomes pretty uh, easy to see that um, in order to maintain the same VC dimension, if I make T go up, then I have to make K go down to balance that out. Any questions about why that's the case? Okay. So if we increase the number of code nodes K in the base decision trees, how should you adjust the number of uh, decision trees in the ensemble uh, T? Then it's going to be uh, just the, uh, the, the same relationship that as K increases, then T must decrease. In practice, with, uh, with, with boosting methods, it's very common. So having two different hyperparameters that somehow control like the same thing, K and T both controlling the, the same thing, uh, it's, it becomes difficult to adjust those two things simultaneously. So in practice, it's very common to use k equals one, which is equivalent, 100% equivalent mathematically to our that decision stump. and then only vary the T. Up until 2014, this was the state-of-the-art method for uh, uh, all computer vision problems. And, uh, but then 2014 is when deep learning started becoming computationally efficient. And, um, and now deep learning wins out in, in vision problems. But again, if you're on like just a random CSV, unstructured data, it's not vision, it's not text, then uh, uh, this is going to get you with it. If, if it's not the best, it's like within 1% of the best. Um, so this is always a good thing to try first. I'll say that it's SOTA, state of the art for most problems. Alex? Question is, uh, how is this related to random forests? Random forests are an example of an ensemble method. Um, they have the same hypothesis class up here as, the, uh, as this right here. And the base method in random forests is, uh, is decision trees. And so yes, yeah, very, very closely related. Um, The 
question. Any other questions? One last method for us to uh, talk about here, and that is nearest neighbor methods. The two key facts to know about nearest neighbor methods are that the VC dimension of K nearest neighbor methods is infinite. Um, so the, the textbook gave some uh, examples of infinite uh, hypothesis classes that were pretty artificial in the, the VC dimension chapter. The main one that people think about of being have something having an infinite VC dimension is uh, K nearest neighbor. And so immediately what this implies is that we can't have no VC generalization guarantees. And in particular, we can't have a bound that looks something like E out is less than or equal to E in minus DVC log in over in. Nothing like that can exist. And in general, you can't say anything about the difference between E out and E in unless you make some sort of assumptions on the underlying data sets. What people typically think about for uh, VC dimension and other infinite dimension uh, hypothesis classes is not trying to bound E out minus E in, but making some other VC, some other bound not based on the VC dimension. And so here, if you notice this bound right here, so this is something that we can say about uh, the nearest neighbor hypothesis. On the left-hand side, this is the true error of our hypothesis right here. So this is something, uh, we still can't know this, we can't know the true error, but we can know the in-sample error. Uh, so true error of R, hypothesis is bounded by then blue here this twice the Bayes error or the uh, best possible true error. And it turns out that this bound is in fact tight. You can't, for one nearest neighbor uh, classification, uh, you can't make, you can't get any better than this. You're always gonna be at least twice off of the true hypothesis uh, or the true function. That's very different than all the other hypotheses that we've seen, that all the other hypo hypotheses, uh, they, if, if you have enough dimensions, then you can get to the, uh, the true error. Uh, nearest neighbor methods cannot get to the true error. And um, so this will immediately apply, imply that nearest neighbor cannot work on a problem with lots of noise. Uh, because E out of F is like a measure of how much noise we have. And so whatever the amount of noise that we have, nearest neighbor, in the best case scenario, after infinite amounts of data, can only give us twice that, uh, uh, the amount of noise. Sometimes, for some problems, estimating thinking about the amount of noise in, a da in the data is hard. Um, but for other problems, it turns out to be not too bad. And so in particular, if we come back over here and think about a problem like this, here I know that the amount of noise in this data in this learning problem is, is basically zero. Uh, the reason I know that is because humans are able to solve this problem. If you have a problem that humans can solve, then the noise is going to be basically zero. And so nearest neighbor is likely to be, um, or has a chance of being good. Uh, so nearest neighbor is often used on like, I don't know, geometric problems or problems where uh, um, humans are, are known to be good at that problem. 
somehow we have to know that there's a small amount of noise. The other interesting thing about, well, before I go on, any questions so far? Um, the Bayes error is in words e out of f, which is just like the inherent noise of the problem. And there's nothing that you can do to, to get better than the e out of f. No hypothesis class can do better. Adding more data points can't make you better. Um, changing your learning algorithm can't make you do better. This is the, the <coughs> lower bound on, on your on your error. You can't get any better than this. Um, that's the first thing about nearest neighbor. The next thing about nearest neighbor is this over here. And uh, it turns out that this factor over here is much worse than the VC dimension factor. So I'm going to rewrite that down here. Put the square root of D into the negative one over D plus one is much worse than the VC bounds. And what I mean by that is that, so if D equals two, actually if D equals one, then what we're gonna get is that, uh, call this term up here, uh, just epsilon standing for our error, the difference between the, the two terms on the left and the right, then epsilon is square root of D over N. And this is what we look like for the, uh, the VC dimension things. But then when D equals two, then our epsilon is the square root of d over n, um, the third root of n, and then d equals three, epsilon's the square root of d over the fourth root of n. And so uh, these things are making as the dimensionality increases, we're shrinking in at a faster rate uh, than square root. And so the amount of data we need uh, is, is growing much, much faster than it does in the VC dimension bounds. So because of that, you really need your dimensionality to be very small for nearest neighbors. And um, yeah, there's not really good rules of thumb about exactly what it means to be very small, but um, I'll say like on the order of about 10 is, um, if, if something is bigger dimensionality than 10, then I would just be extremely skeptical about a, a nearest neighbor approach to the problem. Um, so going back again over to this problem over here, from a noise perspective, nearest neighbor seems like it's potentially a good approach, but the dimensionality of this problem is much bigger than uh, 10. It's 784 was the dimensionality. So nearest neighbor by itself, not going to work. Um, uh, and so nearest neighbor almost always when it's used. So those all those things together will imply that nearest neighbor when used is almost always um, combined with a dimensionality reduction step. And that could be either the random feature or the PCA uh, feature map.
And it turns out on that hand digit recognition example, if you try to use nearest neighbor by itself, uh, the accuracy is not very good, but just adding, just doing this uh, feature uh, reduction uh, like this uh, makes your makes your accuracy much, much better and competitive with things like neural networks. Any questions about that? Okay, so that's all the different models um, that we're going to talk about inside of Scikit-Learn. Uh, what we're gonna do uh, next in class is we'll start talking about uh, some deep learning things, actually working with uh, text and, um, and uh, vision data sets in um, uh, good data efficient ways. Um, and so we'll be seeing deep learning models for that. One last, thing on this sheet though uh, that we're talking about super informally is uh, multi-class classification. So everything that we have talked about up above, it's all assuming, it's all talking about binary classification still. Anything where we're talking about the VC dimension, it must be talking about binary classification. Multi-class classification is the sort of next natural generalization where we have, if C is our number of classes, then our output is somehow uh, just the numbers one up to C. Um, so again, that's equal to one, two, three, up to C. And we don't have, we can't use VC theory to make a statement like this. So this is not a VC dimension bound. Uh, this is a very informal statement right here. But the key thing is that, uh, or the key addition here is this uh, square root of C on top. This is sort of the right way to think about um, the generalization error of multi-class things. Actually formalizing this, it, act, it doesn't end up looking exactly like this because um, the VC dimension doesn't make sense. The, it gets combined into a single dimension term, something called the Natarajan dimension. And um, a graduate level like machine learning course would go into all sorts of different uh, dimensionality measures that we have for hypothesis classes beyond the, the binary classification case. Uh, but we're not going to talk about any of those things, and we'll just say that multiply your VC dimension by the number of classes, and that'll give you a, a good rough bound on your generalization here. Any questions about that? Okay, well, last problem then down here, we'll go ahead and work it. So it says you're doing an image classification problem where you're determining whether an image contains a dog or not. And you have found that logistic regression with the second degree polynomial kernel provides a good balance between training and generalization error for your data set with these uh, properties right here. And you're considering extending your classifier to predict not only whether there's a dog or not, but the breed of dog. And there would be 80 different uh, dog breeds. So our um, 80 different breeds right here. So C would be 80. And the question specifically asking how many more training points would you expect to need in order to get a similar uh, generalization error? How many more training points would you expect to need? And so with this bound up here, if we uh, substitute 80 in for C, we need to make N 80 larger. So N equals uh, increases by a factor of 80. And so uh, need approximately Eighty thousand data points for that. Yes, thank you. There should be a zero after that eight. 
very skinny zero. Uh, so depending on how much you liked chapter two of the textbook, then this is either a relief that we're not talking about this in detail or you're uh, thrilled to just be able to multiply by C and not have to learn a whole bunch of new technical definitions. Any questions on anything from today? Okay. It's a little bit early, but we'll just uh, end early today, celebrate the midterm that way. And uh, uh, next time we'll be starting talking about uh, yeah, the deep learning stuff a little bit. Actually stopped.